Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Gloria Chow. I am a navigator for Mastrius. And welcome to tonight's Meet the Mentor event with Andrew Conklin. Andrew is a figurative painter. His paintings have been exhibited throughout the US and won him a number of major awards and grants. Andrew has taught graduate and undergrad students in New York City and Chicago, including the New York Academy of Art, Parsons School of Design, and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, among others, and has continued to teach workshops in Dutch painting techniques. His work has been published in New American Paintings, and he has authored articles for The Artist's Magazine and other periodicals. Andrew's work is represented by Gallery Victor in Chicago and Signet Contemporary Art in London, UK. Andrew has a mentorship group scheduled to launch on Tuesday, October 9th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, for more information, please check the Mastrius website. And for tonight's event, Andrew will be discussing some shortcuts to drawing the head, essentials of proportion and form, and also things to look for when drawing facial features. So here we have Andrew, over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Gloria. Appreciate this. Um, thanks for the introduction. And I'm looking forward to demonstrating and explaining um, some of these ideas that come from Leonardo and others when it comes to painting and or rather drawing the face. So I'll go ahead and start. I want to show you some slides to kind of give you a sense of what I was looking at when I was musing on this idea of um, looking at Leonardo as someone whose ideas in proportion um, might be helpful in drawing the face. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me go ahead and jump over here and you should be able to see my slide there yes okay great all right terrific all right so um the idea for this was you know looking through this book that i uh, received of leonardo's notes um he uh, got me interested in his ideas of facial proportion. And of course, his notes range all over the place, every subject you can possibly think of. Um, but I was looking at, um, you know, I've been drawing and painting faces for a long time, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. But I, I really hadn't used Leonardo as a kind of guide. I was aware of his um, ideas about proportion, but um, there are other sources that are more contemporary that I thought were more useful, but I decided, well, let me take a look at Leonardo and see what he has to say. And um, and then my idea is to, to take his basic format and then draw ahead based on that. Um, so what I wanna do is look at a few of my paintings and drawings of heads and faces over the years, uh, and then show you the Leonardo notebook section that I was looking at for inspiration and the setup measurements that he used and then demonstrate. So some examples of my work. Um, I did a Mastrius Meet the Mentor uh, talk a little bit earlier, which you can find online, where I talk more broadly about my ideas and concepts. And I showed a few examples of my self-portraits. Um, so I'll just show a couple here. This was done from life in a mirror uh, when I was an art student in New York City, um, just working from like a single bulb suspended over a table at night. So uh, it's a kind of dramatic and uh, I guess kind of graphic image um, of a self-portrait. Uh, this is done around the same time, maybe a year later, uh, painting that um, remains unfinished. And again, using a mirror and this time under natural light, um, working in my studio in lower Manhattan. So here I'm just kind of figuring out the proportions as I go. I wasn't really doing any measuring per se. Um, so I want to show you again some examples of heads that I've done over the years, uh, mainly paintings, but a few drawings as well. And almost all of these are done from models. Most all of them are done from life. So the model comes in and poses for approximately three hours at a time. Uh, I work up the painting in layers, 
you know, maybe it's five to 10 sittings, something like that. Uh, but of course, I'm doing more than just the face. I'm usually doing the, the figure as well. Mm -hmm. In some cases, I'm looking at inspiration by other artists. This is Ang uh, on the left and my um, a detail of one of my paintings on the right. couple other similar kinds of paintings. And again, working from the model allowed me to make direct comparisons with individual people. Um, when you're looking at someone like Leonardo, he's looking for a universal application of proportion. He's not really uh, interested in, in specifics. He's like, what are the things that unify all the faces? Uh, that's what really what his aim was when he's looking at proportions. What I'm seeing when I'm painting these individual uh, models is the differences, the specific likenesses, uh, the things that make them look like them. There's a few others as well. And so over the years, I've sought models that uh, convey a kind of emotion. Um, and I cast them much like a casting director would do for a play or for a movie. I look for individuals that I think will fulfill a certain role because of the way they look. Since the painting, unlike a movie or a play, is silent, um, you have to, the, the, the gesture, the face, the lighting, the pose, the colors, all that has to convey um, your idea and your emotion. And kind of a juxtaposition here between the male and female artist and model. And here's a self-portrait from fairly recently. And this is again done from a mirror under natural light. And a few drawings. The one on the left is charcoal. The one on the right is graphite pencil. All right, so looking at Leonardo's notebook, again, it got me thinking about um, what was he after? He intended to write a book on anatomy, but he didn't finish it, unfortunately. But he did leave a lot of notes. Apparently, you know, there's there are many notes that have disappeared over the years, even though a lot has been maintained or retained. But there are some things that have been lost. So I suppose we'll never know the uh, the true depth of his uh, experimentation or exploration. So this image is fascinating to me. Um, it seems to say something very simple, very clearly. Um, but there's some ambiguity about it because of the way it's written the way it's identified, and the kind of sketchiness of the drawing. So I'm going to paraphrase, again, from the translation of the book that I'm using. Um, and so in some of the notes that accompany that image, he says, the top of the head to the hairline should be equal to the base of the nose, um, base of the nose to the parting of the lips. So he's saying that this, uh, the top of your head to your, to your hairline is basically the same vertical distance as the base of the nose to the part of the lips. He says the tear duct of the eye to the top of the head is equal to the tear duct to the chin. In other words, the tear duct is halfway down from the vertical from your head to your chin. He uh, says the space between the parting of the lips to the base of the nose is one seventh of the face. And he says those three small units are all equal to each other. So those three small units here, what looks like A, D, F, M, and uh, the other one, you, you can't make out those letters. And of course, he's writing in mirror image, so that makes it a bit confusing. But all those three small horizontal rows are supposed to be equal to each other. Yeah. <clears throat> so what I did was I um, I took his image. It's slightly, when it's printed, it's slightly rotated downward. The, in other words, the horizontals aren't totally horizontal. So I just brought it into some graphic software. I just straightened it out so it's horizontal and verticals are more aligned. And then um, I just superimposed some vector lines over it to kind of clean up the sketchiness of his drawing because some of his lines start to angle a little bit uh, because it's sort of rapidly drawn. But it, it seems like he clearly knew what he was doing and what he was aiming for. Um, and so what I've done is um, uh, tried to break it down according to his ideas. So on the far left, I have a series of magenta rectangles um, the width of the rectangles is not important, but the height is based on his idea, one seventh. So in, the, in other words, from the top of the head to the hairline is a seventh of the total head. So those are seven boxes stacked on top of each other. 
Uh, and then I've divided the rest of the head from the hairline down to the chin into three zones, very much like he seems to be um, doing in his drawing. So the first zone uh, goes from the hairline to the, basically the eyebrow, um, and then from the eyebrow to the base of the nose, and then from the base of the nose to the chin. And then he talks about those other things, like the tear duct and the parting of the lips. And in his drawing, I've highlighted those in purple and in green, where he subdivides those thirds into smaller parts, more thirds. Uh, so in other words, it's a third from the eyebrow to the tear duct, and a third uh, of a third from the base of the nose to the parting of the lips. And so that's what I tried to do there. So he says that the space of um, the part of the lips of the chin can be divided into thirds. The indentation at the top of the chin is a third down from the part of the lips. Now, what I've done then was take some photographs and just of different people and try to superimpose those on top of his drawing to see how well this seems to work, just taking people just at random. So I took this uh, still from a film uh, about Christy Turlington, the supermodel. And uh, there's a still where she's just looking off to the distance. So I just took a screenshot of that and um, superimposed that over there. I slid it over here so it's out of the way. And you can see I've lined up the top of her head where it would be the top of her skull. There's a little bit of space for her hair there and matched up the chin. And then you can see that her tear ducts hit that purple line her eyebrows hit the other purple line, the base of the nose hits that green line, and the other, the part of the lips also hits that other green line below it. So if we remove the Leonardo, you can see that um, she pretty much uh, matches up pretty well with Leonardo's idea. The top of her head to her hairline is that first seventh, and then you drop two sevenths down to the eyebrow. You drop a third of that third to her tear duct, then that last third of the face from the base of the nose to the chin, divide that into thirds and you get the part of the lips. So it holds up pretty well. Mm -hmm. That's probably why she's uh, such a supermodel. She fits these elegant proportions so perfectly. Right, yeah. Now I should mention that Leonardo um, often couches, he seems to couch some of his language in the, in the idea of should or could. In other words, he doesn't say that every single person will be this. He says that they should be this. So I think, and he was certainly one aware, very aware of caricature. He would love to caricature. So he would be aware, well aware that caricature or distortions in the face or things that go off of the perfect uh, measurements are completely normal and uh, we can expect that. Uh, as a matter of fact, as an artist, you probably should exaggerate where it's really helpful for likeness. So again, we divide the head in half, we get to the tear duct. <clears throat> um, and I use this um, image, it's a pretty famous image from um, uh, the Jerome uh, drawing. Um, uh, that's a kind of cast drawing, very famous cast drawing of this unknown woman of the Seine, for kind of very famous cast drawing, which is um, probably just a model that was cast in plaster. Um, and here I've divided the head into sevenths, and you see on the green over there. And then I've subdivided uh, the everything from the hairline down into thirds. And you'll see that that first third goes from the hairline to the eyebrow, the second third from the eyebrow to the base of the nose, the last third from the base of the nose to the chin. And then if you divide that, that last third in half rather than in thirds, you get the indentation of the, um, the chin or the, uh, the kind of lower part of the lip where it meets the, uh, the chin there. Mm -hmm. And those are color coded in yellow, red, and blue. So looking at some of, uh, again, I'm gonna look at both Leonardo's quotes and some other ones that are fairly common uh, to kind of bring this out a little further. Um, so again, we have the, we can divide the face into thirds or the head into, or the, really the face into thirds, subtracting out the hairline. And again, you see on this model, you'll see the hairline. Now she's got a bit of a widow's peak and a lower hairline. Um, we go to the eyebrows, to the base of the nose and to the chin. I think the one, issue I would have with Leonardo's um, proportions is that people's hairlines tend to vary quite a bit uh, because they're not like something like this, the, the brow ridge where it's very stable. Hairlines have a lot of variation. So 
when you're working with this method, you have to be aware that you're going to have these variations. Mm -hmm. uh, Leonardo also said the eyes are separated by the distance of one eye width. And that's what you see over here. Uh, he also says the depression between the lower lip is halfway between the base of the nose to the chin. And you can see that works out pretty well there with those orange brackets there. Mm -hmm. um, he also mentions the pupil and the tear duct. I think he mentions that are lining up. The pupil lines up with the, the width of the mouth and the tear duct with the width of the nose. Can't remember if that's from him or from somewhere else. It's a fairly common one. Uh, this was not from Leonardo. He has some other measurements about the ear, um, but I this is another one that uh, I use in my own work, and that's from the back of the eye to the back of the ear is, is equal to the back of the eye to the chin, and that's pretty pretty uh, fail safe. He does have a lot to say about the side view, but I didn't include that in this presentation. And again, taking another just a, a, a random photograph, trying it. Uh, you know, I've tried these these grids on multiple images just to see how consistent it is, and it works pretty well. There seems to be some uh, differentiation between male and female faces when I try to uh, uh, you know superimpose them on Leonardo's grid or his structure, and that may have something to do with the fact that I suspect he was mostly measuring men and probably not as many women. Uh, I don't really know that for a fact, but that's just my hunch. Um, and so male jaw lines tend to be heavier. And so some of those measurements below the nose tend to look a little bit off if you're measuring female faces compared to male faces. But in this case, this one holds up pretty well. You can see that her top of her head to her hairline is about a seventh. Go mm -hmm. down a couple, your, her eyebrows are a little bit higher, but her eye, her tear ducts hit that midpoint. That that's that turquoise line, that horizontal line. The base of the nose hits that next third, and the chin hits that last third. And if you divide that last third into thirds, you can see the part of the lips hits that white line there. Mm -hmm. So pretty consistent. All right. So to do this drawing, um, what I want to do is use his measurements as a kind of setup on this image of the model. And then I'll proceed to draw this and uh, see how well it holds up. Now, normally, um, if I'm drawing from life, I will usually set up a simple seven um, um, horizontal line grid and use his ideas of the hairline, the eyebrow, the base of the nose, the chin, and use that structure and then pretty much wing it from there. But I'm going to get a little bit more specific since I'm working from the photograph here. So if this is my reference image, what I want to do is go ahead and superimpose that same grid that I did on the blue head to this image here. So again, the magenta boxes are one seventh going down. And then the orange line is the first uh, seventh at the hairline. Now, again, she has a kind of widow's peak, so she's got a lower hairline than probably average. Uh, those purple lines, the, the top one is the eyebrow, and then the tear duct. That's a third of that third box, of that middle box, rather. And then the green area is the base of the nose to the chin. And if I divide that vertically into thirds, you get the part of the lips. And so this is pretty good. It really uh, correlates very well to his drawing. Mm -hmm. Here I can see them side by side. And you can see, again, the correlation is quite good. I don't know, Gloria, have you ever used this kind of uh, measurement before? Yeah, I'm used to the, the thirds and the thirds. Yeah, yeah. I haven't um, come across the seven. Yeah, I oh. guess I didn't read uh, Leonardo's <laughs> notes. Well, <laughs> It's, uh, it's they're not super accessible, I have to say. Yeah, so it's great. Yeah, it's new information for me. So a little bit more, yeah. you know, parameters to for measurement. So yeah, it's okay. great. Okay, good. All right, and then I noticed here that if I were to just for the sake of the drawing for width purposes, I noticed that from her cheekbone to her ear um, was a made a square from the base of the nose to the head. Now that's just somewhat coincidental to the pose, but I'll use that in this case of this drawing and setting up the widths. You can see that here, I'm mostly concerned with the heights. I'm not really measuring the widths. Normally it's better to measure one direction or the other in a drawing. Uh, measuring both at the same time can get a little bit busy, a little bit confusing. Um, but in any case, I've got this 
the square here, that dotted line, that will help me kind of orient the face and place it nicely and get the, the size properly. All right, so what I'm going to do is, um, my idea here is to draw the head seven inches, so every one of those seven units will be one inch, and I'll use five inches as my width. Um, so I want to set up my grid for the scale and the position. I'll add those landmarks, refine the contours, try to kind of indicate the shadow zones, render the shadows, and I, I probably won't have a lot of time to render all of the thing, but um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll do, do a little bit of it. Yeah, that's great. Okay. All right, so I'm going to switch to my phone here. So give me a second. Let's see what this looks like. Um, let's see here. And let's see how this looks. All right, I got to tell it to, there you go. Let's get a little straighter there. Okay, that's pretty good. Does that look okay? Yeah, that looks good. All right, very nice. All right, and then I'm working from, I'm going to work from my iPad. Um, I should have that same image that I showed you here over there of the girl. I'll try to put them next to each other so you can see him a little bit better. Um, let's see here. Everything's reversed, <laughs> so it looks a little strange. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's tough that way. Yeah. I'm trying to move the opposite way <laughs> and get lost. Right. That's about the best I can do here. Yeah. All right, got a little bit of a shadow here as well, so that's, I hope that's okay. Is that, is that going to be okay? Yeah, that should be fine. Okay. All right. So um, what I'll do is I'll, I'm just going to use pencils that are color coordinated to the grid that I showed you, or fairly closely color coordinated. So <laughs> first I'll set up uh, this grid of sevens. So let's see, I just mark off here. Two, three, four, five. All right, so I'm just setting up seven inches here and I'll just draw that across. I'm just using a little T square here. Oops. Get this a little straighter here. All right. And then what I want to do is highlight some of those zones. Um, so that first zone is where her hairline is, that's orange. So I'm just going to reinforce that with orange. And jump down to this purple zone, and that's where the eyebrows are. And here's where the base of the nose is. This is green. So what I want to do here is um, divide this zone into thirds and divide this green zone into thirds. And to do that, what I want to do is just take my ruler and just rotate it um, so that three inches fits into two inches. So I just tilt the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thing to get it to do that and then just get that one inch, let's see, right here. And the purple one right there. And so that's going to be that third. So that's where the tear duct is going to go. Tear ducts go there. And then the part of the lips should hit about here. Oh, that's a good tip to make the thirds. Make it, yeah, it, it works pretty well. Yeah, because like for me, I would you so know, you to to calculate it. Calculation. You know, it's, two it's inch divided by three is, you know. <laughs> you don't want to waste your time with that. Don't waste your time with that. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good tip. It's going to mark the edge of the face on the left here, two inches away from the page, just, just arbitrary and five inches across. So that's gonna be my boundary for the width of the head. So one, two, three, four, five. And just mark that off here. So that's gonna be the boundary. Um, and just for the heck of it, I'm just gonna mark the halfway point there. 
just so I know it's halfway. And we're ready to go. Okay, so now at this point, I'm just gonna zoom this in a little bit and get these out of the way here. And smooth this down. I don't know if I can get this to quite the size I want, but it's pretty close. And then I can just start to draw. So again, if I'm looking at the, I'm just using a graphite pencil here. I may switch, you know, I'm going to switch to this uh, black color pencil so it's a little easier to see. Because typically when I'm starting my drawing, I'm starting very light. But mm -hmm. just for the sake of this demo, I'm going to go a little heavier so you can see it. And then again, I'm kind of placing the eyes, kind of following this thing that tear duct will just about hit there. We'll get to the detail in the eyes a little later. Let's see. Yeah, we got to get the other eye in here somewhere. Tear duct. Pupil is somewhere about there. Somewhere about there. Down to the nose. So when you're looking at the, obviously with the nose, you have to look very carefully at the uh, the way the cartilage is designed. There's a kind of break in the nose um, from the top plane to a downward facing plane. So you want to look for that. I don't know if you can see, can you see anything? Yes, yeah, it's, clear. Mm -hmm. it's not that clear. So as I mentioned, normally I would just have um, just use those uh, those basic lines: eyebrow, nose, chin, and then the rest I'd kind of wing it. Usually, I will I will look for a halfway point because getting those tear ducts in the right place or getting the eye in the right place is is very useful. I think mm -hmm. filter from here, and then here's the upper lip there. Sorry, my paper's got a dent in it for some reason. And the corner of the mouth should line up below the pupil. Mm -hmm. So that's right about there. And the upper lip faces down mainly, so it doesn't catch as much light. And here somewhere. The lower lip gets a lot more light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's more a three-quarter view, so it'll be harder to make like vertical interval measurements, right? You know, for people if they would like some guidance, you know, like vertically. Um, yeah, uh, well, I mean, a three quarter, three quarter view is a good view to draw. Mm -hmm. I think of a person, it tends to give you a good likeness, um, a, a front view of a face, you know, is considered usually not that good artistically speaking, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, because it looks kind of like a, like a driver's license photo. Yeah, mugshot. What if yeah. something like that? <laughs> yes, they tend to be a little flattening. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes the likeness aren't that easy to read. Um, if you look at someone like Holbein, you know, the really great uh, Swiss, you know, um, portrait painter, worked in England a lot. He likes three-quarter uh, views quite a bit. Not all of his are three-quarter views. Mm -hmm. uh, but he seems to prefer that if possible. 
it does a beautiful job. It also adds a liveliness to the, you know, to the image as if the person's sort of turning their head or turning their body. And so the, the, the torque of the difference between the head and the shoulders can make things look really interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. just a straight on head you know, facing forward view but a, a forward facing view also kind of connotes uh regalness royalty uh you know if, if we're talking about um portraits of royalty they're often facing directly toward the viewer you know you could think of um well ang's portrait of napoleon even though he you know technically was you know he kind of crowned himself <laughs> royalty, but it didn't start out that way but often um and then uh, holbein's portrait of henry the eighth also faces forward one, one of them anyway the, one of them faces three quarter i think there's one that um faces full on and there are others as well um but then you think about um asian uh paintings paintings of from china where the king is shown and the queen is shown facing directly forward or you think of egyptian pharaoh uh, images. Um, th in this case, they would be sculpture. There's a forward-facing element to a lot of those. They're meant to be seen straight on. Sometimes the back is not even carved because no one's supposed to walk around the back of the king's sculpture. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you're only supposed to be in front of it. You're not supposed to go behind it. So, okay. so the forward-facing image is a one of yeah. It's like severity, and regality, and so on. You know, regalness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Imposing, an imposing quality. Right. Not sure that's showing up very well, but yeah, it's yeah, I can see it. Let's bring up Derek's a little more here. Yeah, there's always so much to learn about in like historical meanings, like symbols and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like different. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, there are differences, but there are also similarities. You know, that's the thing, you know, that um, there are those unique elements. Um, but surprisingly, there's a lot of overlap, you know, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the arts and there's often a lot of um a lot of the same stories get retold under different guises mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's interesting with um all the differences and then all the similarities too like i guess humanity it's all kind of exactly fun, really yeah you know. um, yeah you find that out you look start yeah you look at different art from different cultures you see a lot of differences but then once you start really looking deeply you find that a lot of the themes are the same um and uh you see you know you see the different cl classes within a society mm -hmm. you see the way you know um way characters are you know you have kind of the theater you have stock characters you have very similar types of characters across culture they may have different names, but they often play similar roles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's uh, it gets to be surprising. I mean, this is this was, of course, one of the the great things you know that modernism tried to do, and one of its roles was to try to look for those those universal things, right, that were beyond the specific culture, to try to uh, close the gap between different cultures. Mm -hmm. And you see that to this day. Yeah. Yeah, because I always believe that we're all like one people, really, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's... Um... I mean, yeah, it, absolutely. And when it comes to, yeah, and when it comes to even like these facial proportions and the way people look so different around the world, but there's so much consistency um, to these proportions when you get down to it. You know, you draw different types of people, different ages, different cultures, and they often have, you know, like the proportions are not that not that different mm -hmm. person to person. Do you generally do a lot of drawing, like practices, studies? Um, 
Well, the kind of drawings that I do, there's really two kinds of drawing that I do um, when I'm working. Uh, one would be the kind of drawings in a sketchbook. So I'm working out ideas for a painting and I'm either just you know, coming up with ideas without a, a model, which is just working out the ideas on my own, just mm -hmm. thinking up what I want to do. I might be looking at some other painting um, or I might just have an idea that is just generated, you know, through imagination. So those tend to be very, very simple uh, drawings, very mm -hmm. sketchy, very loose, mm -hmm. very like, quick. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other one would be um, working from the model um, where I will do what's called a cartoon. So mm -hmm. the cartoon drawing um, is a large drawing that uh, that captures the basics of a pose uh, at the scale that I want to that I want to use. So if I want it to be a certain you know three feet tall or something, I will draw the, the make the drawing that size on large paper. Mm -hmm. and that paper tends to be dressmaking paper, mm -hmm. uh, which is fairly inexpensive. I have a, like a large roll of it and um, they'll draw on the dressmaking paper and then I'll transfer that onto the canvas. So um, those drawings are just, they're just mostly outlines. They don't have a lot of detail or shading. They're mostly just for proportion and for the scale. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess. Yeah. So dress making paper, you find them in like fabric stores? Oh, or... uh, yeah. I ordered it. I think I got it online. Yeah. Fabric store would have it. Mm. Um, and it has a grid on it, it has a grid of inch, oh. it has inch by inch grids on it. So it's very useful for measuring because it has a superimposed inch by inch grid, mm. both horizontally and vertically. And so it's very useful. Um, and then there would be one more intermediate step, and that would be um, when the model comes in before I actually do the uh, that cartoon drawing. I'll sometimes you know work out the sketch a little bit more detail with the model again in the sketchbook, and those again tend to be pretty quick drawings, mm -hmm. um, just, to, just to finalize the pose. And then, um, like I said, that pose is then transferred, and um, uh, and then I start painting. Mm -hmm. So would you have like, you would draw out the idea of your poses first before your models come in? Yeah, yeah. And have mm -hmm. them pose, you know, like your yeah. ideas type of thing. According right? to the idea, yeah, according to the idea. Okay, yeah, that's good. But then yeah. you know, things can change though, you know, things can change. Yeah. So even though I work out an idea, a lot of times once the model gets in the studio, then you start working together, then you realize that you know this idea wasn't such a great idea and the model comes up with something better. So it, it's usually very collaborative. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can't just do it all on your own. I mean, you can come up with the idea, but then you know, once the model is there, then things will often change. Right, right. Well, this, you know, the same idea will persist, but the specifics you know, often change. Mm -hmm. Because the model will just, there's something about the way the model works that makes one idea better than another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you have different sketchbooks? Um, like say one for some just rough ideas and one for like sketches and and maybe others for more, more refined drawings or are they kind no. of- No, it's all just this, all the books together. just get used up in order. So. Yeah, the books get used as I use them. So they're just mm -hmm. chronological. So okay. the sketchbook. Well, typically I have I actually will have usually two sketchbooks at a time. One is a small one I carry in my backpack. Mm -hmm. It's a moleskin, usually, those little ones. They're like mm -hmm. three by four or whatever. Mm -hmm. Those are for making quick quick sketches, like whenever, you know, mm -hmm. whenever I have an idea or whenever I see something. Um, or just just to carry around just in case I need it. I mean, it was a real staple when I was starting out as an artist. Uh, remember, that's before cell phones. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. you, if you wanted to catch an idea, you had to you had to sketch it out. But obviously now everybody has phones, you know. So if I see something, 
Uh, sometimes the, if I have time, I can grab the phone. Even so, even with the cell phone, it's still often difficult to, if you see something really in front of you, you often don't have enough time. I don't have time to grab the phone, pull it out, you know, turn on the camera. By that time, the thing you've seen is gone. You know, if someone makes a gesture or a pose or they move a certain way, you might notice them on the street or whatever. You, you know, usually there's not enough time to grab that unless there's, you know, there's a situation where they're not moving for a while. Um, so often I uh, just remember it and just sketch it, just sketch it in the sketchbook. So for example, I saw a person walking in the subway and they were holding their skateboard, but they were not holding the skateboard under their arm. They were balancing it on their upturned hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. So there was, they were walking. So there's no way by the time they walked past, there wasn't time to get my camera out and take a picture, right? They were already past me, but I remembered it in my mind and I just drew it out from memory right there. Oh, okay. So that, that can be helpful. So that sketchbook is just one I carry with me. It's small. And then I just use them up as they, as they get filled. I just go on to the next one. Um, the other one is the one in the studio. It's on my tabaret. It's a regular eight and a half by 11 type book. And that's the one I sketch out, um, you know, work out things with the models. And again, that gets used up until it's full. And then I just move on to another one, you know, just date them and then put them away and move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. wow. all right so we're almost at 45 which is kind of where i plan to end uh hopefully you can see that i'm just going to move this over a little bit here so i'm going to see it a little bit better yeah so yeah see. looks great so yeah again this is um it, it it's a little bit of um if I'm working from the model, I probably wouldn't set up this many, you know, this elaborate of a grid, probably just those sevens and hairline, eyebrow, base of the nose and chin. And I might do this one here. Remember that uh, he said that halfway between the base of the chin is the indentation of the lower lip, which actually hits pretty well on her as well also. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about it. Normally I wouldn't go this far, but you know, now that I've seen that his method seems to work, you know, I might be tempted to use it. Uh, mm -hmm. in my drawing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So you would you would put a, a grid on when you do just, your just the vertical lines, just the just rather these horizontal lines to measure mm -hmm. the vertical. So yeah. I would typically I'll and I'll tell this to my students when we when we draw the head, we're going to figure out how big to draw the head before we draw it. So I recommend usually a seven inch head for most situations if we're in a, a class. Um, and so I'll ask the students to take your ruler, just mark off seven, you know, from zero to seven, mark mm -hmm. off, you know, one inch for the hairline, skip mm -hmm. down two inches for the eyebrow, two inches for the nose and then the chin, and then put one over here as well. And that's about it. From there, we just draw. Um, because if we have those guidelines, then when we're drawing, we can see how much the model really uh, holds to those guidelines and how much maybe the model varies from the guidelines. Typically, the hairline is the thing that varies the most. Uh, the other ones are pretty stable. You know, there there can be some difference also when exactly how much of the eyebrow is above the line or how much is below. And some people have heavier eyebrows. Some people's eyebrows are arched. Some people's are straight. So that tends to vary a little bit. But the base of the nose, the chin, that's usually pretty stable. Pretty stable. Mm -hmm. But doing this is interesting. If you do this over and over with many models, you'll start to find what is consistent and what varies. And you'll start to get a sense of um, how much you should follow and how much you should, um, you know, you should do your own, um, you know, kind of use your own uh, intuitions on um, on the proportions. But I think it's it's helpful to look at Leonardo. Um, you know, he he did a lot of obviously did a lot of research and a lot of measuring, and um, I think his ideas are are quite uh, useful even to this day, many hundreds of years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I like the the, the seven divisions because normally they just say hairline to eyebrow and the eyebrow to bottom of nose and bottom of nose to chin is one third. And then they usually don't talk about, you know, how much is um, uh, between the the top of the cranium into yeah. the hairline but it yeah. could vary yeah. some people say like yeah. three quarter of the way so this is yeah. more like one third yeah. so 
If yeah. you use seven, seven units, seven parts is, I think, very good. It's very stable. And that's in his own notes. So this is a guy that did a lot of research and thought a lot about it. So I would definitely yeah. recommend following his advice. Yeah, he's done enough portraits. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, do you find that? Yeah, well, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, thank you for showing us uh, Leonardo's tips and secret nope. tricks. <laughs> I don't have all of them. I don't got them all. And there's a lot of them he probably never divulged, unfortunately. You know, he had so many, so many ideas going on there. But this is just to give you a sense of it. And yeah, um, let me just, hold on one second. I've got the book. I'll just show you that book real quick. Oh, give great. Me yeah. <clears throat> And let's see, this one is, okay. Uh, Anna Su is the author. Oh, me, okay. And this is Leonardo's Notebooks. And this... this is the one I'm working from. Yeah, her last name is spelled S-U-H. And oh. the first name is Anna, A-H, Anna Su. So um, this book is published... Uh, it's published, let's see, 2005. Oh, wow. Okay. So, there was notebooks. So, this is a good one. Yeah, that's interesting. Translations are good, and um, the, the pictures are clear, and it covers really all of his. I mean, it's not just anatomy, it's there's all this astronomy, there's all the botany, there's wow. architecture, there's sculpture, there's weapons, there's medicine, probably, there's everything. Yeah, it's yeah. the whole. But I'm mostly drawing from the uh, first part with the human anatomy. Yeah, yeah, such a yeah Renaissance man. He's just good at everything. I wonder if there is any contemporary equivalents or of <laughs> someone approaching that genius. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. People are supposed to be getting smarter all the time, so who knows? We have all this stuff to build on, which is the important thing. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah, like I said, if, um, and, um, the, your mentorship group, uh, is scheduled to launch in a couple of weeks. So do you have any plans for like the group or is that the type of things you're going to go over? Or I guess it depends on the group too, you know? Like, yeah. It depends on the group, but I, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I have an idea to kind of lay out sort of six basic, um, topics and mm -hmm. among those will be yeah will be the face and facial features and i want to go in depth into the specifics of the eyes nose mouth ear and so on um mm -hmm. as well as other elements of perspective and color and uh, um, shading and materials so a little of all that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah you need oh, to know sounds... composition, that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah. try to cover all the things that a, a painter or artist would need to know to make a successful painting. Right. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Yeah. So, looking forward to to it launching. So, if if anyone uh, of you or anyone you know that might be interested in group, please um check out the Mastrius website for Andrew Conklin's mentorship group. So yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. Sure. It's my pleasure, All right, thanks.